apologize. The last couple of times I'm with you, I was to be here in the evenings, but the evenings were pretty tough for me. So again, uh, I know Gene stepped up in a short notice, um, definitely short notice, um, and, and anybody else. So I really appreciate that. And I'm, my apologies, but glad to be back tonight. And, and I'm not going to take a lot of your time tonight. I'll make it simple and short since I went a little bit longer this morning. And so hopefully the, 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 the quality of this lesson will be more so of a bringing things to your mind of encouragement. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight is, is just considering how much we invest in time and the things that we invest within that time. We know that in our lives we have things that we, we must do. We, uh, we must sleep, right? Um, how much of that we get or we choose to get or how old we get anymore. Uh, anymore I wake up at a certain time and I can't go back to sleep and it is what it is. Uh, but then we also go to work and we labor. Um, Maybe there was a point in time where it was sun up to sun down. Maybe you were part of that group. Uh, maybe it's an 8 to 5 thing. Maybe it's a 12-hour shift. Whatever it is. Um, in our lives right now, as the greenhouse gets going, I'll go to work. And then I'll come home and then we'll keep working until the sun goes down. And we'll usually eat dinner around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And that's just the way it goes. Uh, but within that, we also have children and kids' activities. And, and we have other things that we uh, have dedicated our lives to. Some of those things are a given. Some of those things we automatically do because we're adults or we're parents or we have families. But there's other things that we choose to associate with and spend time in. Uh, my son plays basketball. That's a choice. So if he's going to dedicate that time, he does. He does bowling and he does golf now. And it's going to be every day this week that they'll have practice. Uh, my daughters are invested in some time with their, the things that they do, and it's every day this week that they have to do that. And so we have to schedule time throughout this week to do those things. Uh, I prioritize food. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, automatically, that's going to happen in my life. I always tell my boss that when they schedule work, work meetings, I get upset because I tell them that it was built in my contract that I at least get one hour of lunch, no matter what. And so if you're going to have a work meeting, you have to provide the food. And so, I mean, this is my time, right? And that's kind of how we view it. Uh, within that time, sometimes I'll go to the park, and sometimes I'll take a walk or take a run. Uh, sometimes I'll read my Bible. It depends what it is. So within that time that we have, we make a choice to do something. In the evenings, we might like to watch sitcoms. We like to watch the ball games. Today, I watched a little bit of the ball games. But I also found myself scrolling through social media. I also found myself playing a game on my iPad. Uh, then I found myself outside, kind of enjoying the day for just a little bit. And, and my youngest boy, uh, he picked up all the sticks out in the front yard. So it was an amazing thing to watch him do that. But that's a choice that he had that he wanted to spend his time. As we look in our lives, in reality, we have X amount of time. And we really don't know what X is. We have no idea how long we will live in our, in our life. And so as we know that there are 24 hours in a day... Within that, what are we going to use that time with wisely? And I'll be the first to admit, I've wasted it. Man, I've wasted it, and I've wasted a lot of time. A lot of time. If, I, if God could put it right in front of me, he says, Kevin, here's all the hours that you spent sleeping, you spent exercising, you spent scrolling through social media, watching television, goofing off, you name it, whatever you did. Here's all the time that you spent. But also, you labored a lot in life. You've done a lot of physical activity. You've done a lot of yard work. You've done a lot of things for your home. Uh, you've done a lot of things for a business, a company of some sort. And even that can be a waste of time. Because we can engross so much of that. We, we work so hard for certain things and that we miss out on some of the important things. Because, again, we want the almighty dollar. We want the corporate ladder. Or we just, we're busybodies. Uh, some people can't sit still. Some people can't do nothing. You know, they always have to be doing something. And in that, it can be discouraging because... If we're always doing something, maybe that, uh, that we think is productive, but yet we're missing out on opportunities over here, whether it's with our church or with our children and so forth, it can be in vain just as well. So what are we using our time in the sense of being wisely, especially in spiritual things? Because we know how much time we spend doing all the other stuff. And I know in the end of the day, you're like, okay, Evan, Kevin, I get it. I understand what you're saying. I got to spend more time maybe reading my Bible, making sure I go to church, sending cards, uh, praying and doing a lot of other spiritual things, but also I can do those other things, right? Well, yeah, to a healthy measure, as long as those things don't bring us into a measure of sin. But even still, think about that. Even though we might have some sort of a freedom to do those things, 
should we do them in reality? What more important things can we do? Because again, our time is X, whatever that is, that I'm going to be here in this life. And what can I do today to be productive for not only today, but also tomorrow when it's all said and done? When I look back at yesterday, how productive was I in the grand scheme of things in my life? What did it help me do? Did it help me grow in any facet? Did it make me any healthier? Uh, did it make me any closer with my wife? Uh, did our kids, do we bond in anything? Uh, did I help some neighbor out? Did I help a friend out? Did I, did, I, did I help someone in the church? And all those things, when it's all said and done, that was just one day. What about a week? What about all the other relationships maybe we're having challenges we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, the, the, the conflict resolutions, how we re resolute those things? How much energy and time have we put towards those things? A great eye-opener for me was a couple of weeks ago. I went to my first physical therapy. And when I was in the first uh, physical therapy, I'll let you guys know I'm 43 years old, right? And so when I got there and I was sitting in the waiting room, I looked around and I was the youngest person in that waiting room of at least 20 people by at least 20 years. And I thought, man, am I old? Are they old? Am I young? What's going on here? So, but I looked around and the number one thing you didn't see of all those people that were a lot older than me is no one had their cell phones out. Amazing. And I, I had a tendency to take out mine because I was wasting time. I had to wait another 20 minutes or whatever. But none of those people had their phones out. If it was a, a, a man there for his physical therapy, his wife was sitting right next to him. If it was her that was there for physical therapy, her husband was right next to him. They weren't alone. They were together. Now, obviously my wife, she worked, so I, she wasn't there with me. I was there alone. But I thought for just a moment, I'm going to pull out my cell phone and I'm going to do what my generation does. And we're going to sit here and scroll through social media and we're going to waste time. But they didn't. They sat there. They did one of two things. They talked about randomness, especially weather. That's what old people talk about. And or they just stared. They just looked around the room. They just observed. They just thought. They just didn't do anything other than within the social media aspect. And I thought, why don't I do that? Can I do that for just a moment? And I did. And I tell you what, it's just a totally different way of life. It's a totally different world that those people live in. And you're like, holy cow, where did this world come from? And it's mind-blowing because of all the other things that go through your mind of the day, good or bad, but you've allowed those things to enter your mind so that you can now address those things. When my physical therapy was over, I got to go to work. I got to be a boss. And I'm already thinking about those things. I'm thinking about the physical therapy. I'm thinking about, okay, what's going on tonight in the family? What's, what's, what, what happened yesterday within the family? If I was to th scroll through social media, the only thing that's probably going to populate through that is either the scores of something or some terrible news of something or some stupid politics or whatever those things are. And it's never going to allow me to focus on the things that I need to focus on that I can help change and help improve. And so then I had to, th to make a choice. How often am I spending time with the things that matter? And I find myself, the more that I sit there and waste time on playing a game on my iPad or scrolling through my, my phone, those important thoughts that I need to address, do you know when they finally hit me? 11 o'clock at night, laying in bed. And you wonder why we can't go to sleep. Because we never thought about those things. We never addressed those things. We never cared about those things. We never fulfilled those things. And so now when we don't have all those things in our minds, that's when they hit. And now you address those things. But how do you address those things? We usually address them in a the state of worrisome. In a state of stress. Because we've not dealt with those things and now we can't go to sleep because now we got to deal with those things i want to bring forth a simple passage a parable here of the marriage feast jesus spoke to them again here in matthew 22 in parable saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come again he sent he sent out uh, other slaves saying Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat, fattened livestock, and all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they pay no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was in, in, enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and those, I'm sorry, I can't read tonight, murderers and set their city on fire. 
Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, as many as you find there, and buy to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The application of this is that there is a grand invitation. And we know that invitation is why we're here tonight. But when I think about this invitation, I think of the invitation, the calling to come to Jesus Christ in eternal life. Absolutely. But I often find myself guilty that although I've got the invitation, although I've RSVP'd in the invitation, and I received the invitation, I accepted the invitation. But have I gone back to farm? Have I gone back to business? In other words, am I truly preparing myself for this wedding? For this feast, for this moment? He says, I prepared everything for you. All that is mine, I have prepared. The fattened calf, the, the best, the grand and grand of all parties that have ever been thrown, the wedding feast, I have prepared this. And I'm inviting you to come to this. And so at one point, we may have come forward, we've been baptized in Jesus Christ, we've received this invitation, we've accepted the invitation. But since that moment, maybe I've allowed so many things to elapse in my life, and elapse in my life, and elapse in my life, and then how prepared am I ready for this wedding? Have I put other things in place in such a capacity that I'm no longer interested as I was in this feast? It doesn't excite me as much anymore. I can't wait to go like I used to go. Uh, remember when we all got married, those who have gotten married, you know, the, the planning stage and the excitement of it and all the preparation of it and purchasing things and getting ready and the, the excitement for that day was to finally come here. And so are we still excited about that moment, this invitation to coming to Christ in the same sense that we did the day that we were baptized? But although we're still here, we still have time that we've put into our lives, we've engrossed ourselves so much within the mundane things of life, all the things that I talked about earlier and much more, and so now the preparation of this, the invitation of this, we may have kind of pushed aside just a little bit. Now, we don't know the date of this invitation. We don't necessarily know the, the full grand party of it. Truly, this, in this sense, is the day that you decide to come to Jesus Christ. There you go. But the full fulfillment of this marriage feast, in other words, the, the eternal life going to heaven one day, we don't know that moment. But within that, have we given up, in one sense, to say, well, we don't know when this feast is. Is it really ever going to happen? People doubt. They let this life get to them. And all of a sudden, now they're consumed by the things of this life. And we've forgotten so much about this feast that we've engaged ourselves within everything else. Again, we wake up every single day, and we've got a laundry list of priorities today. And we've put all those things of this life in that priority list. Some of those things are entertainment. Some of those things we feel like we have to do. Some of those things we have to do for the man, you know, the workplace. Some of those things that we do for ourselves so that I can eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of my life until the day I finally pass on. But have we given ourselves over in such a way that we have forgotten the path? Notice he says, we invited them in, but some, they rejected it. They turned, they went a different direction. So the invitation, the feast of that, they rejected. Now, we may not feel like we're a part of that group. But what does he also talk about? He talks about the other sense of this group who says, well, we have other more important things to do. We recognize it. They didn't deny it, but they had more important things to do. And then we find a man here. He says, well, how did you get in here? He climbed up some other way. He found himself trying to get to heaven by some other method. Maybe it was or wasn't through Jesus Christ. Maybe it was through the things that, uh, of the gospel. Uh, but maybe he still had a, has his old way of life. I don't know what the case was for this man. But somehow he found himself in the sense of Christ, but he didn't know who he was. He didn't know how he got here. And so, so oftentimes we're trying to get to heaven in such a way that, well, I still want to live my life. I still want to do all these fun things. And I'm not saying we can't do fun things. But we put so many other things in front of ourselves when the most important things that are right in front of us we miss. The opportunities to help somebody. The opportunity to encourage somebody. To, to assist somebody in whatever capacity it is. Stopping in our lives to, to turn everything off that I'm just going to say a prayer for this person. 
stopping everything in my life so I can come into church, so I can worship my God and partake of the Lord's Supper. And putting so many other things in our, in our way, but it's, at the end of the day, he says, well, I believed in you, God. I, I knew you existed, but in reality, I didn't do really anything in my life of service for you. And so in, the, in that man's case, that was probably it, that he may have thought about God or believed in God, knew that there was a creator, but he never truly followed God. He never truly followed Christ. And so with that is, how did you get here? What method did you find yourself in this case? And so often, I think a lot of times is, we feel like we can get to heaven if we just believe. And there's no other aspects to it. Now, I'm not talking about works and those things. But again, it's the, the things that we do, the prayer, the Lord's Supper, our attendance, our reading our Bible, our serving one another, our loving one another. Those are all things that are products of us believing and following Christ. Those things aren't going to make you a Christian, but those things are products of you being a Christian and following Jesus Christ. And so what does he say here in verse 13? He says, The king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot. Throw him into the outer darkness, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. To think of that God has truly invited us to this monumental moment in life. And that's eternal life. And God sent forth slaves, you want to call them angels, prophets, disciples, apostles, Whatever, whoever it was that he got his word out to us. The invitation. In other words, the invitation is this. We are unworthy. We don't belong. We're not a part of this. He says those who were originally invited, that could have been the Jews in this case. You, we invited them, but they didn't receive me. They rejected me. So fine, I'll go on to the next. And he went on to the next, being maybe since the Gentiles. Those who didn't think they had it. He brought forth anyone that was willing to come in to receive the invitation. And many did. They received it. And they welcomed that. He's prepared everything for him. Now think about this. We don't deserve the invitation. We don't. But he sends forth this free gift of eternal life. He has given us everything. He's prepared everything wonderfully for us in the sense of eternal life in heaven. So why is it so often in our lives? And again, I'm guilty of this, folks. Why is it so often in our lives we exchange this world for that? Jesus said, what would a prophet of man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? And we do that day in and day out. Every time that we scroll through our phones for hours on end, I'm not saying it's wrong for you to scroll through your phone. But when our entire life is consumed by those things, when we go to work from sunup to sundown and we let it engross us because we want to work or we want to the almighty dollar, we want to bigger possessions in life, and we've traded this life for that. We've invested so much time and energy into this life instead of that one. And we talked about it this morning. Solomon talked about it. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Everything under the sun is vanity. It's a waste of time. It's worthless because in the end, it can't save you. It can't get you to heaven and you can't take it with you. And so when we look at all the things that we engross ourselves in life and say, how much time did I waste? You ever seen the movie Oscar Schindler? I think a lot of you have. In that movie from the Holocaust, when it was towards the end, Oscar Schindler supposedly had bought and saved thousands, millions, I don't know how many Jews it was. But when it was all said and done, it wasn't about how many people that he was able to purchase and save, but it was how many he didn't. Because then he looked at his car and thought, I could have bought ten more. He took the ring off of his hand and he said, that could have been three more. And so, in reality is, is, all the time that he tried to invest and all the money he invested to try to save those people, there was still so much more he felt like he could have done when it was all said and done. There are so many people in our lives, all the way around us, that are suffering. And ourselves included. No one may come forward this morning or tonight and say, I need prayers, but every one of us does. And everyone needs our care and some support in some way. But although people are all the way around us crying out in some capacity, how many of those people do you help on a daily basis? And I'm not just talking about with physical needs because, you know, they're suffering from an illness like I have, you know, my wife type thing. But when I go to work and I see people just fist bumping and they're happy and they're joy and the next day they're not, there's a golden opportunity that we find out why. Maybe something going on at home. Maybe their family, their kids, their spouse, whatever it is, 
And that's a golden opportunity to seize that moment. Now, I could turn from that employee and I go back and I say, well, I've got to work on a project that my boss really, really wants me to get done by 1 o'clock today, so I can't really deal with you right now. That's more important. What can help that person more so from a spiritual standpoint opposed to pleasing the, God, the, the boss? I'll eventually get what the boss needs or I'll just tell him, hey, I didn't have time. I had more important things to do. But where do we invest our time and our energy when it's all said and done? Do we grow our relationships with our families, within our spouses, our marriages, our children, uh, family, no matter what it is? Do we grow up our children in the ways of the Lord? Are we teaching them, instructing them? Are they spending all their time on video games? My kids love video games, absolutely. But there's a time out. Now we've got more important stuff to do. We're going to go outside and we're going to do all this yard work and we're going to get all these things. We're going to get us beautiful and we're going to enjoy and it's going to be amazing. But does it really matter when it's all said and done? Yeah, we want to do those things and we can do those things. But if we're going to spend X amount of time within the physical things of this life, we ought to focus our mind so much more on the spiritual things that are going to help one another and get ourselves to heaven. And that's what I really want us to stop and think about for a moment. Of all the time that I have in a given day, how much time have I devoted or should I devote or will I devote to encouraging someone else, to helping someone, to get involved in their lives? To figure out what's going on in such a capacity that I can help change your life. But also in the end, knowing that it's not going to help me grow just as well. I'm not going to grow spiritual things playing on my phone. I'm not going to grow in spiritual things, always doing the yard work outside. Even though I can experience God's creation, that's amazing. But at the end of the day, when we bond and we fellowship and we grow together, that's what's going to get us and them to heaven. And so how much time do we invest into one another when it's all said and done? Final verse tonight, and the lesson be yours. In Ephesians chapter 5, he says this. He says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I don't, I'm not proposing to add to Scripture in any capacity here. But in verse 16, make the most of your time, because the days are they're evil, is what the Word says. But they're also short. And Hebrews 10 actually talks about that too. The days are evil, but the days are short. There's opportunity that Satan is going around every single second. And he's trying to seize that moment. To get you to trip up, to get somebody else to trip up. But although we have a short amount of time, because X, we also have engrossed so much of, whether it's sleep, whether it's work, whether it's activities. So the time that we actually have with one another, because we've invested so much in every other thing, is so short. It's so short. So how do we capitalize on those moments? Whether it's doing away with certain things or limiting activity on certain things or whatever it is, but it's just seizing the moment. Because knowing that someone out there, again, is crying. Again, someone around you every single day of your life is suffering from them. They're addicted to something. They're falling short. They're worried about something. They're crying about something. They're stressed about something. And it's right in front of our faces. And so therefore, he says to us, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men. That we are always seeking those opportunities. That we're always thinking about that. That we're not blind to those things. And we're not ignorant to those things being right in front of us. And verse 17 says, Then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. God's will is not that I go to work and that I exhaust myself in stress to the capacity that I make another man or woman rich. Now, in Timothy's letter, yes, I do need to be a father and provide for my family, absolutely. But I could do that with a lot less. The will of the Lord is not that I spend so much time within social media arguing or getting upset about the posts that people have that I have no control over whatsoever. He doesn't encourage me to sit down and watch a sitcom full of filth, but yet see it as entertainment. And there's so many other things in our lives that we engross ourselves in, but that's not the will of the Lord. At the end of the day, God says to worship Him. At the end of the day, He says to love Him. And He says He loves my neighbor as yourself. And to serve one another, be hospital one another, serving one another, loving one another, encouraging one another, admonishing one another, rebuking one another, if it has to be that way. But He says embracing one another, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing melody with your hearts to God. That's the will of the Lord. And the will of the Lord is that we do whatever it is to the capacity that we grow closer to Him and that we stand firm when it's all said and done, that we encourage one another to get to heaven with one another.
So tonight, consider the time. Consider your time and what you invest in it. And think in the ways that you can encourage one another, that you can grow and you can get better in those ways, that you can make full use of those time to make sure it's worthy and make sure it's honorable and make sure it's valuable. Lessons for you tonight. The invitation to give your life to Jesus Christ to come forward or even to come forward to ask for forgiveness of sins. May you come forward now as we stand and sing.